Hello, scholars. Welcome to one of the career panels from the dream.us. We are very excited to have some fabulous alumni from our program ready to share with you uh, some words of advice, their experiences being in the career field. And um, so thank you to the panelists for being here today. Scholars, this is really an opportunity for you to ask lots of questions. We've put together a, a panel of um, variety of job functions that our panelists are involved in. So take advantage to connect. Um, feel free to use the chat box right now to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, what college you're going to, what your major is, and maybe even add what you wanna be, when, what you wanna do after college. Um, this is an opportunity not only for you to hear from this panelist, but also for you to network with each other, to, to um, get to meet each other, other people who wanna be in the healthcare industry. Um, also feel free to uh, put in the chat your LinkedIn profile and then connect with each other via LinkedIn. I know that some of our panelists will also be putting their LinkedIn profiles after they introduce themselves um, to you so that you can connect with this amazing alumni who can be you know, your future um, go-to people for quick questions related to healthcare careers. So network, build relationships among each other because you're all pursuing a career in this industry. And with that, I'm just going to go ahead and start because we have lots of uh, great panelists. And I'm just going to ask and keep, please keep introducing yourselves in the chat. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, uh, Angel, for introducing yourselves in the chat. Please, uh, I would like to hear from all of you. Uh, we would like to know who we're speaking with and keep also um, going to your LinkedIn profiles and sharing those, those links so we can connect with you. So we're going to start just with very quick intros from our panelists. Um, but before I do that, I also want to give a shout out to Sadana. As you know, Sadana is our alumni in house and staff member who's uh, helping in so many different ways to support our scholars. So thank you, Sadana. We also have another staff member, Camila. I don't know if Camila, if you want to take yourself off the, um, the camera for a second just to wave and uh, say, just to wave to the scholars so they, they know you. Again, one of your fellow alumni and also on the staff of the dream.us. And with that, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to please uh, introduce yourselves by telling us um, your name, the college you went to, when you graduated, and what is your current job and your current company right now. So I'm just gonna go around uh, the screen Evelyn, I see first. So, so Evelyn, why don't you go ahead and quick intro. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Evelyn Cruz. I graduated from the City University of New York at Brooklyn College with a bachelor's in psychology in 2019. And then I received my master's in mental health counseling in May, 2021. I am a bilingual psychotherapist at Interboro Developmental and Counseling Center. Thank you, um, Evelyn. Let's go ahead with Daniela. So, hi, my name is Daniela. Um, I graduated from the University of Houston in 2019. I am currently at Guiding School of Medicine at Dartmouth, and I apologize, my cat is meowing in the background. Um, and currently, I'm interested in going into women's health, possibly ob -GYN, Um and have been heavily involved in both asylum clinics and different organizations that involve women's health here. Great, thank you, Daniela. Uh, and I love cats, by the way, it's my favorite animal. Um, Shanti, why don't we go ahead with you? Hi, my name is Shanti Florissant. I graduated from Florida International University in 2020. I'm currently a registered nurse at on the telemetry unit at Northwest Medical Center. Thanks, Shanti. And Jorge? Good evening, anyone. Uh, my name is Jorge Contreras. I'm currently a epidemiology technician for the Dow County Health Department. 
I graduated in spring of 2020 with my bachelor's in biology, minor in psychology, and right now I'm pursuing a master's in sociology where I'm focusing on the impacts of COVID um, to, towards on, on doc, undocumented people here in the Rio Grande Valley. So looking forward to that. And, and yes, I have cats too. <laughs> and you're also thinking of applying to med school, right? Yes, correct. I, I know, uh, at least for my situation in Texas, it's very difficult for DACA or undocumented to go to medical school. So that's why I'm open for, uh, for my horizons in a way. That's why I've been delaying. And, and that's why I got my passion towards public health. Right. Thank you. Uh, Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, I graduated from Trinity Washington University in um, 2018 with a bachelor's in biochemistry and uh, mathematics. And I am currently a first year um, PA student at Thomas Jefferson University. Thank you, Laura. Um, and last but definitely not least, we have Sandra. Uh, we uh, unmute yourself, Sandra. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Sandra Andres, and I am an HR generalist. I work for pediatric home health care. I graduated in 2018 uh, with a bachelor's degree in psychology, co minors, um, and I'm super excited to be here and be part of this panel. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, the next question I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of you to share a little bit about how is it that you came to have the current job that you have or be at the graduate school that you are currently in. So just tell us a little bit about the trajectory, um, how you got there, who helped you, or, or how did you find out about your job, what helped you get it, uh, any certifications or licenses that you needed to have in order to get the job that you had. Um, and anything related about how your immigration status might have impacted you or not in your in seeking the, the job that you have. So just give us a little bit of, a, of your story uh, of your uh, in into your career, into your field. Um, so let me uh, just, I'll go back to the beginning to the first person that introduced herself. So we'll start with, with you, Evelyn. Okay, yeah, so for my field, um, a Bachelor's in psychology is most beneficial. It's possible to apply for a master's in mental health counseling with a different degree, but you would still need to fulfill prerequisites. So if you have a, um, a bachelor's in psychology, that's best. And um, I did have to do internships on, in my undergraduate and graduate um, academics. They had to be unpaid in the state of New York City, at least, they have to be unpaid internships. So that that was a little rough. And, and I'm sorry, Evelyn, and it has they have to be unpaid internships because the, the reason? Um, we just have to work with nonprofit organizations for mental health counseling. Got it. Okay. For undergrad. Mm -hmm. But if they had offered to pay you, could you have accepted payment? Well, the rules changed a little bit due to COVID, but prior to that, we could not accept any um, compensation for that. Got it. Okay. And it had to be a year-round internship as well. So in the last 10 months, I, I was doing my internship. Um, so I interned at Interboro. I applied because a friend of mine who graduated last year, she recommended this site and I really love the, the clientele is very diverse. We see patients um, from all ages, all different backgrounds, and I'm able to provide um, sessions in Spanish there. So that's what really drew me into this, into this organization. And I did apply to one site during um, my internship journey and they declined me because they asked me a question about citizenship. And even though I, I told them I have a working permit, there might have been some miscommunication. They thought that I might need um, sponsorship if they hired me after my internship and that was not convenient for them. So that, that was a different situation. 
that I had to handle and it was a little frustrating, but again, Interboro has been an amazing place for me and I just started working there full time. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy working here. And so I did have to apply for a limited permit after I complete 3000 hours of direct service with clients, I'm able to apply for my license to practice on my own without any like supervision. And so that's kind of the, um, the roadmap for mental health counselors. Thank you, Evelyn. And let's move on to you, Daniela. You're, I know you rode to medical school. Yeah, um, so I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so you start off with undergrad and honestly, I think one thing that like really needs to be like reiterated is that it really doesn't matter what your major is. As long as you get those like core prerequisites done, you can do whatever it is that makes you happiest. And I highly recommend doing something that makes you really happy because it's going to set you apart during interview seasons. Um, so yeah, so I went to the University of Houston. I got a major in biology, which is kind of what a lot of people do. I really liked bios so and it worked for me. And I got a minor in medicine and society, which is where I kind of started um, leaning more towards public health things that I was interested in. Um, and then during that time, I did research with one of my PIs, um, highly recommend getting to know your professors and just talking to them. If you think something they said in class was interesting, because that's really like one of the best ways to get research and letters of rec, which are things you're going to need when you're applying to medical school. Um, volunteering, which do volunteering work anywhere you want. I volunteered at an animal shelter and I have nothing to do with medicine, but I learned a lot of skills that were important for medicine and I was able to talk about it and I really liked it. So it, it worked for me and um, it really just shows that you're passionate about whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and then just, you know, focus on grades. And then when it comes to that little free time that you do have as a pre-med, go into organizations that mean something to you, pick something that is you're really passionate about, you care about. It doesn't have to be medicine related. I was an RA and I did, uh, I was a programming director, which I just put on programs for my college, nothing to do with medicine, but they were things that I thought were super important um, in terms of building community in a commuter college like the University of Houston is. Um, and so just really finding those things that are important to you, I think are kind of key things that are going to help you stand out when you start to apply for medical school. And then once you do your four years, get all your um, prereqs in, you go through the application process. Um, being from Texas, um, like Jorge mentioned, it's a little more difficult when you have DACA. Um, recently, things have changed. But when I was applying, I got told straight to my face that because I was DACA, my application was just going to be skipped, um, which is hard to hear when you're like super excited about being a doctor and you work this hard and then they tell you, yeah, it's not gonna work. Um, but don't let that discourage you because there's so many schools that are so willing and so excited to have you as students and they're willing to give you money to come there and they're gonna give you support. So just be uh, mindful of that. And there's a website, I think there's gonna be a resource link that'll get sent out that has lists that I use, um, it might be helpful. And when it comes to applying and finding the place that you wanna go to, um, Keep in mind that this is four years. Um, so if you're debating, should I go straight in or should I take a gap year? Um, you'll know the answer for yourself, but don't rush into anything. You have your entire life to be a physician. Um, it's one of those career paths that you're gonna always be learning in and you're always going to be bettering yourself. So if you take two years for yourself or a year for yourself to just be a person for a little while before you go into something like that, please do. Um, there is no shame in that. And I didn't, and I wish someone would have sat me down and said, hey, it's okay to do that. Because sometimes I'm like, wow, I could be, you know, doing fun things at this moment. Um, and that's totally fine. It really depends on where you're at in your life. But I think it's something that you should really consider because no one told me to consider it when I was applying. And I wish someone had sat down and said, hey, you can take a gap year. And then, you know, once you get to your application and you get your recs and you get, you know, those people are going to tell you your, um, Schools, how amazing you are. Solidify your story. Take being that guy is something that is incredibly amazing, and you have so many important stories and lessons that you're going to gain from that. Learn how to use that in your interview. 
and make that something that makes you not not some burden make it your asset make it i'm daca and i'm going to give you this experience or this outlook on life that you're going to want me to be a physician for you and then apply and find a school that feels right when you go to interview really trust your gut trust where it feels right where you feel at home that's how i ended up here at dartmouth i came it was fall it was really pretty i hadn't said a single word to anyone and the first person that came to me was a, another daca student who was like hey i heard you're daca let's connect find that place find that place where you people are reaching out where you can find that community and it makes a world of difference when you're pursuing a career like medicine Thank you, Daniela, for all of that. And I know I'm going to skip to Jorge now because I know Jorge talking about taking a year off before you go to grad school for medical school. I think Jorge is doing that. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing now as an epidemiologist, but also how you're using this as a gap year to get, get you ready for med school. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you, Tanya. Uh, just first and foremost, uh, like, uh, like I mentioned before, Daniela, me and her pretty much share the same story, but I happened, you know, for me, I decided to wait and take the gap year because it was necessary. Uh, Cause I know we have this notion, this constant notion that, oh, once you do your four years of bachelor's, you already go to medical school. But it took me a long time for me to realize that gap years are okay. I mean, there's no rush to be a physician. Uh, I know for me, I mean, that was my goal all undergrad was medical school, medical school, med medical school. But I know for me, the journey, you know, living in Texas and, 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 you know, such a Republican state and at least living so close to the border, you know, it became just more than just be a physician. I really want to be, you know, really helping the community, not just, you know, with helping them get sick, you know, helping them not get sick, but like, sorry about that, but like actually, you know, helping them, you know, become, live better lives because at the end of the day, you know, there's a close connection between, you know, people who, who have who have it better than not get sick than those who are. And I think for me, that's why I chose public health because it, 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 it encompasses everything that I was passionate for, which is community engagement, health, and, and also edu providing education. And especially during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it hit every, everybody, you know, close to home. And, and, and that's why I decided to, to work in public health and, and it made me realize that, you know, that, that taking a, taking a gap year is fine. And that's why like, I decided to pick up a master's and, and start learning you know, about sociology and trying to learn more about people. So pretty much to sum it up, <laughs> uh, it's okay to take gap years. And also it doesn't matter what major you are as long as you do your, mm -hmm. the prerequisites necessary. Cause I know of friends who are in medical school already and they did their, you know, their master's in art or in history. It, it just makes, it just depends on what you do of it. Cause I know for me, you know, going to, to the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, it was, uh, I had to make the best of it. That's why, you know, I, you gotta put yourself out there in a way in order to make the best of it. Thank and, you. And I think that having a master's in sociology is really gonna differentiate you and help you when you apply to med school. So <laughs> definitely. Now I'm gonna jump to Laura because Laura, I know you thought you wanted to go to medical school and then you switched and decided no, I actually want to become a physician's assistant and you're in grad school for that. So tell us about that journey. Yes, yeah, so um, throughout all undergrad, even you know before then, um, throughout high school, um, all I wanted to do was just get into medicine, um, be a physician. And so I focused a lot on that throughout my four years um, in college. And then my last year, um, I did an internship where I um, was able to shadow like different healthcare providers. So I shadowed a nurse, a nurse practitioner, um, a physician, and then I shadowed a PA. And before then I didn't really know what a PA was and what they did. And so um, I spoke a lot to her. And after that I did all my research and realized that that's like the best path for me um, for both my personal goal as well as my um, professional goals. Um, you know, it's only a two year program. And once you graduate, you can do any specialty that you will like. And so I, you know, consider myself a very um, curious person. And so I want to start with like emergency medicine, but after that, um, 
I do would like to maybe go into cardiology or pediatrics, and that's uh, one of the perks of being a PA, um, is that you can do pretty much any specialty without any extra schooling. And um, also you can um, you know, work as a part-time um, physician assistant, which is something that I am considering once, you know, five to 10 years from now, I want to have kids. I would like to raise my kids and be um, very involved in that. And so being able to um, do my job as a part-time, um, I think it's very important for me. Thank you, Laura. Um, and let's go to Shanti, who chose a different path as a nurse. Yeah, so um, my path was more straightforward. I did um, two years at a community college, um, and then I transferred to Florida International Univers University and received my bachelor's degree. And to become a nurse, um, some people choose to do a two-year program, which is an um, associate's degree program. But um, a lot of hospitals are pushing towards a hot, the bachelor's degree. So I would recommend um, going straight to, um, to going in, um, applying to get your bachelor's instead of starting with the two-year program. Because once you start working at the hospital, they encourage you to get your bachelor's. And they give you a certain amount of time to get your bachelor's degree. So um, while I was in nursing school, I did an internship at... Um, at a hospital I wanted to work at, but there's a um, but there's a hospital. So if you before while you're in nursing school, I'd also I would recommend um, working at a hospital that you're interested in, like an internship, because a lot of hospitals have residencies, not resident like you know new grad residencies where they train you um, before getting on the floor where you have a preceptor. So I definitely recommend an internship and just going for your bachelor's instead of doing the two year associate's degree. Thank you, Shanti. And um, we have Sandra, who Sandra's gonna tell you that you can have a career in healthcare without having to be on the clinical side. Uh, and Sandra, tell us a little bit about what you do and how you decided to get into this job, particularly in the healthcare industry. Yes, thank you. So as, um, as Tani mentioned, I do work on the business side of healthcare. So I am an HR generalist and I have the opportunity to uh, work um, in recruiting functions. So to any of you interested in any healthcare positions, I am a recruiter that usually hires, I've hired nurses all the way from like LVNs, RNs. Um, I've worked with therapy. So we, I've, I've also hired for occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, um, and um, physical therapist. And so I work in pediatric home health care. So um, home health care is an industry that a lot of you guys may not be so um, aware about. To me, I mean, being in college, I didn't know much about health care, first of all. As I mentioned, I graduated with a bachelor's in psychology. And one thing um, to note to any of you guys um, interested in, in or pursuing a psychology degree was I was not ready for uh, the question at the end of my year saying, hey, you're going to grad school, right? And sure, four years is like a long time, but then finding out at the end, almost at the end of my, my, my bachelor's that I have to go to grad school in a, in a major in psychology, I was just like, oh no. I, I mean, I didn't know about grad school. I wasn't ready for grad school. Um, I thought, you know, once I got my bachelor's, I was good to go. And um, eventually I ended up graduating in psychology. Um, I pursued a career in organizational psychology thereafter. So I ended up getting a job in recruitment um, and then having an opportunity to work for this company, which is pediatric home health care. So again, just working on the business side, um, I got to know everything about home health. Um, like I said, there's a lot of opportunities for nurses. Um, all you do need is six months of experience working as a nurse, um, and it's a great opportunity not only to um, use your nursing skills, but make a difference in children's lives. So in home health, like specific in my, my area is pediatrics. So I hire nurses that get to work with children in their home, and they're helping them get better. A lot of the kiddos do need services as far as like throughout their whole life. Others do get better, but just being able to play a part in children's life and in healthcare really um, sets us apart, you know, and giving you that reward. 
So as a recruiter in the healthcare industry, I do highly encourage everyone who's pursuing um, any healthcare jobs or even you know jobs in psychology, finding out like where, what, what can I do? How can I apply my skills? Um, definitely like recommend you guys to keep pushing in those um, healthcare fields and jobs. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, especially for DACA recipients, bilingual um, uh, speakers and Spanish and English. Um, you have no idea how much we struggle sometimes to find um, nurses, uh, therapists, LVNs for children who have um, you know, Hispanic households that only speak Spanish. And so I do highly encourage you guys I'll uh, share my um, email address if any of you guys are interested in more um, learning more about home health care, and I'll be happy to also um, share more about that with you. Thank you. Sandra. And I would ask all the panelists, if, if you're comfortable, is to share your LinkedIn profiles or emails in the chat so that um, scholars can grab those and connect with you if um, uh, it, it, when, when they when they need to connect with you. So thank you, Evelyn, for I see that you share your LinkedIn. Thank you, Sandra, for sharing your email address and Daniela. And so thank you for all, for all of that. And scholars, I'm going to open it up for questions for you um, in, in just a couple of minutes. So start thinking about what questions you want to ask. You have med students, physician assistant students, a nurse, someone who's working on the business end of healthcare, a psychotherapist. So this is your chance to ask anything from like, what do you like about your job? What's challenging? How did you get there? Whatever it is, the question that you want to ask, this is the time. So start putting those questions in the chat box um, or you raise your hand. And we love it when you raise your hand and because then we would love to hear from you, from your, hear your voice uh, so that we can um, uh, move from that. So let me, I see a raise hand. So I'm going to take that right now, Sarah. Why don't you go ahead, unmute yourself, and ask your question. Um, my question is, uh, first of all, I would like to say good afternoon, and thank you guys for this uh, uh, Zoom meeting uh, to inform us about uh, those opportunities to either shift career or you know how to start a new career. Um, my question is pertaining to uh, those of you who actually had a uh, like a major shift. Let's say you you weren't in mid in healthcare at all, and you had your bachelor. How did you start uh, with class with classes? How long did it take you? Like, what are the what is, is there a lot of prerequisites? Do you do you have to like catch up a lot on meeting your uh, uh, your first requirements to actually get in the program? So Sarah, just a follow up question for clarifying. So uh, tell us what college you go to and what's your current major? Um, I went to Queens College and I graduated in speech therapist. And, uh, uh, but I'm most like, sometimes I do also consider, I was, I, I often ask myself, you know, what, what could it have been if I, if I went into PE, PA, if I make a career shift? Uh, and, what, what, and what was your major again? So many uh, pardon me? What was your major again? Speech, um, language pathology. Oh, language pathology, okay. So Laura, what about the requirements to go into physician's assistant? So for, uh, someone, for, someone, for someone who did not, may, who did not get a, a undergrad uh, to become PA, how do you start after you graduate? Like, is it, can you take my, uh, my secretary classes to just uh, meet the requirements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my question. Yes, Thank so you. I actually was missing a couple of requirements um, for most of the programs that I wanted to apply for, I was missing two. And so those two classes I just took um, in community colleges and like two different community colleges and, um, and then I just uh, did my whole application. Um, so as long as you know which requirements you need, um, you can just take them anywhere. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, that you did that with your bachelor's. You can take scattered classes in different colleges. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I see a question here in the chat from 
Is he Austin? He said, I feel like it's very hard to gain experience, volunteering or clinical hours as an undocumented student. I was just wondering how you could navigate and go about gaining experience in the healthcare setting before applying to PA or medical school. Okay, uh, I can answer, I can help answer that one, if that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, I know for me, as, a, as uh, during high school, uh, uh, I was undocumented. And the way I was able to, you know, start getting the shadowing hours and start understanding really what medicine is about is to like just look, visit your local, your local health office clinic. You know, that's what I did. I went to my local town and, and the doctor there, I mean, it's like the doctor of the town. So I just asked him like, hey, you know, pre so pretty much, you know, I was able to share my story and share like my passions. And he, and he, and he took me under his wing. Cause I know, I know that being a documented provides a lot of obstacles and hurdles, but something, sometimes just asking a question and, and being genuine about it, that you really want to learn and then, and they'll most likely take you on. And, and that's pretty much it. I know for, uh, it's not very hard to gain experiences. Anything can become an experience, you know, being in this panel is an experience. So it just depends on what you do. And, and like I mentioned, you know, with the previous, you know, panelists, have have the same thoughts is that you got to put yourself out there you gotta you gotta in a way you know be in the forefront of things you know I know for me I was you know I was in clubs I was in student government I did research so you know in a way it, it does take a lot you know in order if, if you uh, in order to become you know a physician a PA or a nurse it, it takes a lot and it takes you no know, dedication and the willpower to really get through it so yeah hopefully that answers it and it obviously is possible because you have three people on this panel who are doing it so Daniela or Laura? Um, yeah, so uh, actually for like for PAs, um, a lot of the, the clinical hours specifically have to be patient, like direct patient care. And so uh, for me um, during college, I couldn't get a lot of paid internships to do that, but there is a lot of unpaid internships that most of them don't require you like citizenship for those. Um, and then for volunteering, um, usually you also foreshadowing as well, you don't need, um, you know, any type of documentation. Um, but for the clinical hours specifically, um, I know a lot of PAs, um, like be right before going into PA programs, they get their uh, medical assistant uh, license and that's how they get their hours. And definitely you can work with DACA as a medical assistant. Um, you can become an EMT. I did clinical research for about two and a half years and that's how I got my clinical hours. So there's a lot, a lot of ways to do that um, being, you know, DACA with DACA. Thank you, Laura. Um, uh, Abraham, you have your hand raised. Please unmute yourself. Go ahead with your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, so for me, in my situation, I am currently a nursing student in my last year, and I'm looking to pursue for a CRNA as a certified uh, registered uh, nurse anesthetist. So I was wondering um, if where can I find more information about that and like for the DACA uh, uh, situation people. And what state are you in, Abraham? Oh, Illinois. Illinois. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shanti, do you have any uh, words or recommendations for Abraham? Um, maybe like, um, does he have like an advisor at the school, like a nurse, uh, nursing school? You usually have like the advisors because I'm not sure about CR CRNA school. Like I don't know much about how to apply to CRNA school, but I would go to an advisor, like a nursing advisor. Mm -hmm. Abraham, have you been able to connect with other people in your area that are doing that that profession? Uh, I know some people, but they're not uh, too elaborate on how, what steps they took, but so that's why you've, I, you've already talked to them. Yeah, I have. Got it. 
So, and so I think that Shanti is right, is, is about going to um, your, your scholar advisor or to your nurse advisor, your academic advisor, or, or, or your professors. Have you tried to contact them? Uh, yeah, I, I'll try to do that. Okay, so I just have one, um, one thing to add. Um, I know for CR, CRNA school, I've heard that um, you, you would have to like work in the ICU after nursing school for like a few years, take an exam called the CRN, CCRN in order to qualify. That's all I know because my best friend wants to go to um, CRNA school and that's the only information I have. Oh, do you think you could connect your best friend with Abraham? Sure, she's um she's right now she's a nurse. She's interested in CRNA school, but she didn't take any steps to apply yet. So uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can can he put his email in the chat? So Abraham, if you would like to connect with this other person who's also pursuing this degree, email put, put your email in the chat, and Shanti will grab it to connect her you to that person because it's a lot of it is about connections, right? talking to other people that are going through your same, same uh, journey. Um, there's a chat here from Brittany specifically for you, Evelyn. She really wants to talk to you. <laughs> she says she has a ton of questions for you. And if she were, Brittany, do you wanna unmute yourself and maybe ask one question now? Uh, and also she, she would like to connect with you via LinkedIn later to ask you more questions. So Brittany, if you're there and if you're not too shy, would you like to unmute yourself and ask one question right now of Evelyn? Hi everyone, good evening. It's, I'm in Florida, so it's 8.30 PM right now, but hi. And um, I don't mean to just single out Evelyn, but I am a, a psych major and bio minor. So I was really interested in your story. I guess for me, um, I already asked about, you already answered my question about the minor, and I'll definitely look into that. I'll talk to my academic advisor. I speak to her quite regularly. But I guess what I can ask is, for you, now that you've gone through this and you've actually received a master's in psychology, I don't know specifically what, what area you received your master's in. I know that you can receive your master's in one area and then start working in a little bit different of a field. But one, what area are you specifically interested in most? What did you get your master's in? And are you feeling fulfilled right now? Because I see that you're full time since I looked in your LinkedIn. Yes, so I, I received my master's in mental health counseling. I knew that I wanted to do psychotherapy. And so another route for that specific um, field is also social work, a master's in social work. So there's, there are different routes. You can also get your PhD, but for me, and this is just also because I feel like I've been in school forever. I haven't been able to take a gap year. Um, this seemed like the best choice for me. It was just two years. It was a full-time um, workload, but yeah, I, I would say I find it very fulfilling, at least at this clinic. I love working with um, clients from different backgrounds, like I said, working with children, working with adults. It's been quite an experience for me. And I would say that just also being in my own therapy in undergrad and graduate, because professors really recommended it, it just gave me new insight into the field. And so I would recommend that if you're interested, you know, also looking for seeking your own therapy or your own therapist, just so you can get some understanding for your own self. And it's, it's great. You know, sometimes we all need additional support. And I do want to say that a lot of universities provide these resources for um, clients. So definitely, if you're interested, reach out to your schools. Thank you, Evelyn. I, and I see you already told Brittany and gave her your email address so she can contact you. And at this point, I'm gonna ask Sadana to also put in the chat a, a Word document or a PDF document that has a lot of resources for you in terms of medical conferences to attend or research programs that we know are DACA friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Sadana is gonna be uploading that in a minute um, 
when you see it, grab that document and start looking into those resources. And okay, moving on, I see in the chat a question from Fernanda, which I think it's a very good question, but I also see your hand raised, uh, Fernanda. So why don't you unmute yourself and ask this, the question that you have in the chat, Fernanda, if, if it was the same question. Or, oh yeah, or it's the same question. Thank you so much, oh, uh, thank you. Oh, um, I was trying to ask that, uh, what did you get, when you guys were in undergrad, um, when personal life, you know, problems came in, uh, how did you guys deal with it? And how did you kind of like make sure you kept up with school and got better with like handling personal life and make sure, making sure your school life um, kept, you know, like stayed in a good place? I can take this one. I'll start it and please feel free to add if any of the panelists have information. But um, I think one of the things you really need to do is be honest with yourself and, you know, be like, hey, like I'm struggling. And one another thing is just like really break down that barrier between you and professor because there are some professors who, you know, may not be the most caring, but a lot of them do want you to do well. And not, it doesn't hurt to be like, hey, I'm struggling for X, Y, and Z reasons can I get an extension? Or like, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I, and they're really receptive if you go to them and you say, I have a plan to get done with the information that I need to get done. Um, because then it doesn't come off as like, oh, this is the last minute and they don't want to do the work. It's more of a, I'm going through this at home or I'm going through this in my personal life, but I have this plan to get this assignment done at X time. Is that okay? And most of the time they will be receptive to that. And sometimes they won't. And it's kind of important to find that uh, professor in your undergrad that is gonna be that person for you because there'll be that support system and they'll help you figure out who you can go to if you're not getting the responses you want from a professor because there's a professor but there's always your um, dean, dean of academics and there's a whole community within your university that a lot of people don't acknowledge that are there for you. And their job is to be a resource. So really reach out to them. Um, and then the second thing is being honest. Um, I really recommend therapy. I did therapy in undergrad. I do therapy now. Um, therapists don't just do like, you know, like life crises. They're also really good at just helping with like, I'm overwhelmed with school things. How do I like deal with that feeling? They're absolutely wonderful. And I cannot recommend them enough. Thank you so much. That really helps. Like now I, I see how like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And don't forget you have your scholar advisor. Your scholar advisor can hook you up with the resources in the college or maybe outside of college. So that's, that's their role is to help you when the going gets tough. And the going gets tough often and that's okay. You can still keep going, but you won't be able to do it alone. You gotta reach out to others. That's true. Thank you. Thank you guys again for the opportunity to talk to you guys. Uh, there's, there's a question here from Ashley. She says, I'm on bio major with a pre-med track. Would you recommend taking a medical assistant certificate or take another course like in being a scribe? Uh, for me, uh, I was a medical assistant for the longest time ever since high school. I know medical assistant is pretty accessible. Um, you can take the exam. And, and, at, and I think for me, that's that's the being a medical assistant really gets your feet wet. It really helps you, you know, be on, 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 on the floor with the patients. I know for me, that's where, in a way, I perfected my, my small talk. It's just handling with the patients. But yes, um, Evelyn, yeah, I think it's good. It, it, it depends on what you like, because if you want to do emergency EMT, if you like to things fast paced and on your go and on your feet on your go, that's the perfect way. But if you're more into you want to take the time, you know, get talk to the patient at least. Even if, even if your medical assistant, you get to have these interactions with with the with the patients and in a way they look up to you. Um, you know, they see you, especially the older um, patients. They see you as 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 their kid or as their grandson or as a granddaughter. You know, so it's really you know getting getting. It depends on what one you like. Well, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Great, thank you. Um, another question here about nursing schools. 
Um, does anyone know, and this might, whoever here is from Texas, I know Jorge is from Texas, I can't remember if there's anyone else from Texas, Danielle, I think also, um, and also Shanti, because this is related to nursing, she says, what are some nursing schools that accept undocumented mm -hmm. students? I go to U University of Houston, and they don't accept undocumented students, my academic advisor said that I cannot apply to any nursing program in Texas, which doesn't sound right to me because I know some of our other scholars are pursuing nursing in in Texas. So um, I'm wondering, you're in Houston. So uh, any have you heard Jorge or Daniela of other schools? Uh, for example, I know this is a community college, but I know for sure that the in Dallas there is the uh, Dallas College in El Centro. Several of the campuses of Dallas colleges have nursing for undocumented students. There's UNT uh, in Arlington that accepts DACA students for nursing. Any other suggestions from from Shanti, Daniela, Jorge? Um, I'm in Florida, and I know like in Florida, like most of the schools accept undocumented students. Like I went to FIU, Florida International University, and they accept um, undocumented students. I'm not sure about Texas. Maybe um, Daniela or Jorge can elaborate on that because I, I don't know much about the, the schools in Texas. But in Florida, I don't think we have that issue here in Florida. Um, I'm, well, I can't see my Zoom. <laughs> Okay, uh, I know for sure. Sorry about that. It's because I, I was looking it up my my university website. I'll, I know for for each church you be, um, the university that that I attend. I know they accept DACA for sure, but I'm not too sure about undocumented. I know um, the the pathway is like a it's like a getting a bachelor's. So pretty much, the only thing that that probably will stop you from from getting is being a licensed registered nurse. But you can go to nursing school. That's fine, but it's just after and, and and during that time two years a lot of things can happen you know so always crossing your fingers but other than that i think i think you can i think they should enroll you because i i mean that is within my experience because it's just a, like a regular bachelor's program the other thing is that um i know that sadana shared the document that has resources and in that document, the, the last item is a list of dreamer friendly medical schools. I would imagine some of those medical schools also have nursing programs or those universities where those Mexico schools are located also have medical uh, nursing programs. So I would check out that list and start researching those schools websites and see if they also have nursing programs and if they're open. And, and kind of related to this, um, uh, we have a question here it says, does anyone have experience with being completely undocumented, no DACA, no TPS, and going into the healthcare field? I don't have experience, um, but that list, that link that I, that's at the end of that resource, they do separate if you're going into medical school, and I'm sure you're looking for the like you can use that as a like vantage point it does have like it specifies whether or not it's DACA friendly or DACA and undocumented friendly so that might be a place to start um I know a school in Chicago which is gonna um Loyola is very undocumented friendly um and even if you don't want to go to Chicago maybe if you want to reach out to them and ask like other schools that they might know because they're constantly in network. I think UC Irvine is another one that I know is undocumented friendly and has a really good support system. Um, but yeah, if you have questions, you can email me and I can put you in contact definitely with the UC Irvine people to see if maybe they can get some information on undocumented friendly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the one thing that we say from the dream.us is to those students that are fully undocumented, no DACA or TPS, and therefore they don't have work authorization, uh, really think about becoming an entrepreneur and what that might mean within the healthcare industry. Uh, you know, could you go, uh, instead of the clinical side, I don't know if you're on the clinical side or the business side, but 
could you be on the business side? And I don't know if Sandra, for example, you could talk a little bit about, can someone start a business or become an independent contractor and access the healthcare field through those venues? Currently, I am not aware um, of that route. Um, I know with our current um, healthcare employees, um, we do have to have them um, certified and we only work with W-2 employees. Um, so I have not had any recent experiences with any uh, 1099 contractors that way. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, let's uh, move on to Paola. You have your, raise, your hand raised. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, hi everyone. Um, my question was similar to the one that was just asked because I'm finding it, um, on my case, I have, I'm also completely undocumented. I have um, nothing literally. Um, and I'm finding it really hard to even begin to look for internships or even like paid or sometimes even volunteering because even when I go and I try to network a lot of them, you know, they're like the first question that they ask is like, do you have working papers? And that's that's an, that's an obvious no. So I can't even, I'm finding it really difficult to just begin, you know, putting myself out there and to gain that experience to even know like what I'm interested in because that's like a block. And I like that that's kind of discouraging. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if anyone has any experience or they know I have any like internships that or just in general like some information and and paola you're definitely looking in the healthcare field right um yes i i'm interested in becoming like a clinical therapist and then maybe um pursuing a little further than that into psychiatry which is um i know it's going to be really difficult especially given my situation so yes Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure where. Oh, go ahead, Laura. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. um, I'm not sure where Paula you're located, but I'm in New York City, and um, I know that was one of my worries. Being asked, you know, like, are you a U.S. citizen? Do you have a working permit? Um, even though I have DACA, it's always, you know, a nerve-wracking question to be asked. And um, what I found helpful, at least in undergrad, was that just reaching out to nonprofit organizations, um, community centers, usually they, they want volunteers and they don't require too much paperwork, but you know, just reaching out in your local community, seeing any um, community centers, seeing if they can help you around. Also, again, your academic advisors are gonna be you know, a useful tool as well. Yes, I just wanted to add um, reaching out to your professors. Um, I know during my undergrad, there wasn't a lot of scholar, um, like internships that I could apply to. And so um, I spoke with a lot of my uh, professors that, um, you know, what I was interested in doing. And they were able to like try to help me find things. Um, even then, because I was um, wanted to do research for that, um, a lot of my professors were doing research. So they knew um, people that were working in their labs that needed people to volunteer and having those recommendations coming like, you know, directly from them was very good and a, um, like a really useful thing to do. It's just, you know, use your professors or um, they, they want to see you succeed. And I would Thank say, you guys. Yeah, I was going to say in having been in another program that was uh, helping people find um, jobs, you don't have to just go to professors that you took classes from and that you know. Any professor at your university, even though you have not met them before, is a resource. Um, just because you're a student of that institution and you can go ahead and introduce yourself as a student of that institution that you know X, Y, and Z about this professor and would love to have a, a time to get uh, to talk about careers and options. So reaching out to any professor in your school can be valuable. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Let's see. Um, do we want to 
employee. Let's go ahead with Ro Romendra. Uh, Romendra. Romendra, go ahead. Uh, so I'm currently a student at your college. Um, I'm starting to become a PA. So this question is more towards Laura Garcia. Um, I was wondering what distinguished you from everybody else who applied to the program? Was it your grades? Was it your experiences? Or was it a combination of both of those things? Um, so I think it is a combination of everything. You can have really good grades um, and really good experiences, but if you can't really talk about why you're so passionate about what you want to do um, during your interview, you know, you're not going to make a, a good impression. So I think that being able to talk about like why you want to do what you want to do and just, you know, tell your story and don't sell yourself short. Um, you know, we all struggle a lot to get where we are right now. And, um, you know, these people need to know that. And once you really open up to, you know, the um, people that are interviewing you, they'll, they'll know. <laughs> so they basically want to see like what you're passionate about. Because yes. I'm mm -hmm. considering um, volunteering for the Red Cross or the hospital. So I could basically like talk about those things. Yes, exactly. And you can, you know, you can have different hobbies, different um, places where you volunteer. They don't have to be also like everything doesn't have to be medical related. Um, as long as you, you know, bring that experience with you and how that makes you a well-rounded person and how that all ties into why you would be a really good, you know, clinician um, at the end of the program. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I see lots of questions, so I'm gonna move us a little faster. Uh, I think goodness has a question. She is planning on becoming an OT. I think that's an occupational therapist and is currently volunteering at a rehab hospital. Um, she is asking what types of internships and experiences she should be looking to have in order to uh, help her career in that area. And she says, I'm interested in pediatrics. So any types of internships or experiences she says she should be pursuing right now. And I know Sandra, you hire OTs, right? What do you look for? What, what would you say she should have on her resume? When I look for, again, I think just because of the field, right? Um, the hospital is definitely a different field and sector as opposed to home health care. And that's why I want to advertise home health care a lot more because everyone thinks that the hospital is like the, the primary sector where they should be at. And, and sometimes, um, you know, you can find other alternatives like home health care. A lot of people don't know about home health care and the options you have. So with pediatrics and working with, um, uh, new grads, a lot of our positions, uh, we do have some assistantships. So if you're interested in um, being an occupational therapist and you're trying to find opportunities, I would recommend seeking even outside of a hospital setting. Um, a lot of the like, organizations like my uh, company, they do ask for a minimum of six months of experience. So that would be up to like a minimum amount that you would need to have. Um, Definitely um, having some type of, you don't need to have worked in pediatrics as an occupational therapist, but having some kind of uh, pediatric um, experience, um, even outside of uh, medical. I know Daniela mentioned just uh, doing other um, extracurricular activities that brings you that experience that not necessarily ties into clinical um, internships or clinical uh, settings, right? So um, if you have those types of, of experiences that you can tie into, um, an interview or um, just letting them know, hey, I'm interested in pediatrics. You may be completely new and that's fine. Um, that's what we have assistantships for. And um, in those um, types of programs, you do get paired up with a certified um, occupational therapist in the field. So they'll walk you through um, what it is to get you into that position. Once having met the criteria, there's like an hours criteria that you have to meet in order to become an official um, certified clinician, um, just on my, you know, home health um, experience, I'm not sure about the hospital settings as far as, um, you know, their own criteria. However, like I mentioned, home health is, it's booming. They do pay really well. That's 
Also another thing about, you know, working the home health side, um, that the pay is very good and convenient, I would say, because you're not working out in like a, a clinic, right? In people's homes. And so that's also an alternative that I wanted to feature. Um, as far as credentialing, you do need to have um, either a bachelor's or a master's in um, occupational therapy, um, even, you know, doctors, you know, you have a doctor's degree, um, you know, as long as you have clinical experience of six months, that will allow you to start your career. Great. And we know it's at 6.01 right now. I see there's still a lot of questions. If you, any of the panelists are willing to stay on for another 10, 15 minutes, if you can, uh, we can keep going with the questions. Uh, but if you do have to go, I wanna honor your time and thank you for being here with us. But uh, if you can stay for another 10, 15 minutes, we'll tackle a few more questions. I see here that um, there's a question for uh, during interview says, uh, how are your experiences while interviewing as a DACA student? Did it come up specifically for Laura and Daniela as you were applying to grad school? And, and was there any financial offer despite your status? Um, so for me, it didn't, it won't necessarily come up. It's not one of those things you're allowed to like blatantly ask you, are you a DACA student during your interview? Um, it comes up during the application process. You do have to like specify that, but you don't get asked during an interview. Um, and then whether or not you disclose that depends on you. I thought for myself, it was an important part of who I was. And I think I spent a really long time, part of my life trying to hide that and, you know, try to pretend that it wasn't something that I was going through. And it was. And when I was applying to medical school, I made the decision that that's part of who I am. That's part of my identity. And it's part of how I learned who I was and how to be flexible and how to be resilient about things that were not going to work out for me just because that's the way my cards were dealt. Um, and so I chose to talk about it, but I chose to do so in a way that was, I had DACA, these were the challenges it posed, and this is how I chose to go around them or how I chose to embrace that and do something good about it. Um, but that's up to you. It really just depends on what your comfort level is and like do you feel like that's something that is important to you that you want to share but if you feel like this is just a thing but i'm really great besides that and i have all these awesome things that i want to share then share those awesome things don't feel like you need to go out and like disclose that to anybody and as far as financial it depends on the school um at dartmouth um one of the nice things is when you go on to do loans for graduate school um i know Dream that US is doing loan program now, but when I was first applying, there wasn't one. And a lot of people had issues because you had to get co-signers and getting a co-signer sometimes is really difficult. Um, and so some schools will give you a loan without a co-signer. So Dartmouth will do that. You can get a loan through the school without having to get a co-signer. Um, and you just have to have decent credit or even if you have no credit at all, they'll still give you the loan. You just can't have bad credit. It's like the one rule they have. And so, yeah, disclose it if you feel like you need to talk about it, but don't feel pressure to do so. I don't know if Laura had a different experience. No, definitely. Um, I feel like when, depending on the interview, you know, certain things can come up and depending on the level of how comfortable you are with, um, you know, sharing certain parts of your own life, um, you can choose to share what you want, what you don't want. So definitely, you know, you don't feel pressured to talk about, you know, very personal things that you may not be ready to talk about during an interview. So, yeah. Oh, and like um, the financial part. Um, so a lot of PA programs don't offer um, like any scholarships because it's such a short program, um, very expensive one. <laughs> um, but uh, also the loans um, you, most likely we'll have to get them from somewhere else. Um, I know Thomas Jefferson doesn't do any loans unless you have a co-signer, which have, to, which who has to be a US citizen. So yeah, sadly. Okay, let's move on to Jessica. I know you have you've had your hand raised for a little while. Go ahead, Jessica Goliath. 
Good evening, guys. Um, so I just have one question that kind of relates back to Paula's question earlier. Um, so I live in New York. I go to CUNY New York College. And so I was kind of wondering how you guys navigated the whole background check. Because I know once I get to that background check area, that's where things get sort of foggy. Like I could have all the right qualifications, but I don't have like, I don't have a social security number. I'm still DACA pending. Um, I submitted my application. I'm still waiting to hear back from them, but it's getting kind of to the point in my degree where I want to get that experience. I want to get my feet wet to know if I'm heading in the right direction or if I should, you know, switch. So if you guys have any advice of like how to just pass that or if there's some other way you can talk to them, like if you guys did do that, like what did you guys do? So I don't really know. Um, I don't have any experience with that, but what I do know for um, to be um, to be accepted to the program for me, um, we do have to, we did have to do a background check um, and a lot of other things, but um, there is a way that the program itself can overpass certain things. And so I think it really depends on where you want to go and what you want to do and who you can contact um, and make sure you like talk about your situation and why um, you know you don't have a social security number and they may be able to do something for you. But um, yeah, I think it's very case by case. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jennifer, Jennifer JL, go ahead with your question. Uh, hello, um, good afternoon. Um, I kind of have the similar uh, question um, in regards to like the social security, because like I wanted to join a program, but um, one of the requirements was social, like, I guess, so, you know, I don't know if rather it's to start the program or like, you know, at some point you will need it. But that's one of the reasons why um, I, I didn't sign up for the program and instead I end up majoring in psychology. So my question is for you is like, um, can the courses that I'm taking right now help with the, you know, if I do go into the nursing program, help with like some of the credits, get some of the credits out of the way? And you're taking courses in psychology? Yes, ma'am. But I'm, I'm like, for example, like I'm trying to do like science, the science base, not like, um, so, you know, science classes out the way as well. So I'm asking if it, um, it will help so with the nursing program, you know, cause oh. you do, it's science based as well. I don't know if that's <laughs> clear. Well, Shanti, I think were you, you were trying to get in there, answer that question. Um, can she repeat the question? Because I had to step out for a minute. Oh, she's a psychology major right now and uh, looking, wondering how her courses in psychology can help her apply to nursing school. Is that correct, Jennifer? Or Yes, yes, our nursing program. Okay, what it depends on what classes you were taking because um, nursing school, they require certain prerequisites. So it depends like what science classes you were taking. And you would also have to research the school you plan on applying to and see what they require. And so I have another follow question on regards to social security. When do they require that? Like, is it in the beginning or like? You know? Social security. Um, I know they require it for the background check, like for the, um, I don't remember the maximum for social security. I think when you, I don't remember them asking for social security when I applied, but I know for clinicals, you'll need like social security for the hospital, like for the background checks. Mm -hmm. And the clinicals are usually like the third year, second year? Um, clinicals are usually the, um, it depends on the school. For my school, it's um, first semester, like first okay. semester of nursing school. So that's going to be like your third year after your prereqs are done. Yeah. So you, when you start nursing school, um, first semester, we start clinicals. Or third, or third year undergrad, you're saying? Yeah, third year undergrad. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, Did I answer all your questions? Is, do you have anything else? Yes, that, that's about it. Thank you so much. Oh.
And, uh, and I also think this is a, a good time to emphasize that if you are eligible to apply for DACA, please apply mm -hmm. a because it is taking a while for those applications to be processed. So um, if you have not done it yet, do everything that you need to do in order to apply for, for your DACA. Um, status. And if you need help, there's a great organization called immigrationhelp.org. And Sadana can put it in the chat box right now, but immigrationhelp.org can help any of you who need to apply for your DACA for the first time or even renew your DACA. They can help you put the paperwork together to submit it. So please do that. We'll take, uh, I don't see any more hands raised. And I see, uh, there was one question earlier just for those people that are in med school or Daniela, how early should people start studying for the MCATs? Um, I think wait till you get through all your prereqs and then start studying. I made the mistake of trying to study while I was learning biochem, not my brightest move, but you know what happened. Um, but yeah, try and give yourself at least two, three months at least. But really consider what your schedule looks like. So if you can dedicate a month or two strictly to studying, then that'll work. But if you're gonna be trying to do work or research or school, spread that out. Um, it's totally okay to push back the MCAT. It's totally okay to retake it more than once. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah, and I think the best way to go about studying is kind of review the information, get a grip on it, but then really just spend most of your time doing practice questions and then going through those questions over and over again to make sure you know why you missed them because then you're less likely to miss them when you go back around. And in the, again, in the resource um, list that Sadana loaded in the chat box um, is a link to Kaplan. We have a partnership with Kaplan where you will be able to sign up for a free course to prep you for the MCAT. And they will send you books and workbooks and information and, and all kinds of practice tests. And you can also do the, the course, the MCAT prep course online. So you can sign up for that when you're ready. Okay, so uh, I, I know I kept you long enough. I know some of our panelists had to drop you and drop off. Thank you everyone for attending this session. Thank you very much, Shanti, Daniela, Laura, for joining us today, for giving back, paying it forward to uh, the current scholars in this way. It's truly inspirational to see all of you moving on with your careers. And certainly I think inspirational to our current scholars to know that in a few years, they will be in the shoes that you are in right now. So again, good night, everyone. Hopefully it was helpful. Any last minute words from any of you before we close off? Thank you guys again for, for taking your time to talk to us. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, have a good night, everyone. Talk to you soon. Good Bye -bye. night, thank you.